Hello, my name is Chen Yan Wu, and I'm a stereotactic and functional neurosurgeon at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. In a separate lecture, I discussed the role of laser interstitial thermal therapy for mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. I also emphasized the importance of ablation location as a significant factor in terms of optimizing clinical outcomes. Here, I will provide a stepwise approach in terms of how to plan a laser ablation trajectory for the treatment of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Here are a list of my disclosures. The only relevant disclosure for this talk is the one with Medtronic as they are one of the companies that manufactures a laser ablation system. As with any other stereotactic procedure, trajectory planning and ablation location are of significant importance when using laser ablation for the treatment of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. This is something that we learned in a multi-center study that involved 11 centers in the United States. As part of this analysis, we retrospectively looked at the location of ablations performed within the mesial temporal lobe. We then correlated those to clinical outcomes in order to identify the optimal location for laser ablation in this cohort. We were able to perform this group analysis by co-registering all patient images to a common atlas space in a nonlinear fashion. As a result, we were able to represent the ablation location for all patients in a single heat map. So what you'll see here on the left-hand side is a positive predictive value map. And what that represents is a voxel-wise calculation of the likelihood of achieving seizure freedom in the event that that particular voxel was ablated. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, you have a negative predictive value map. And what that represents is a voxel-wise analysis of the likelihood of not achieving seizure freedom in the event that a voxel was missed in the ablation. So the information provided by each of the heat maps is important to understanding the optimal location of ablation. Ultimately, what we want is both a high positive predictive value as well as a high negative predictive value. When we take that into consideration, what we see on the right-hand side is that the ablation must certainly involve the amygdala, hippocampal head, as well as hippocampal body. But as we go more posteriorly, specifically past the plane defined by the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, the utility of performing an ablation beyond this plane significantly diminishes. On the left-hand side, on the positive predictive value map, we can see the importance of including mesial and anterior portions of the mesial temporal lobe within the ablation cavity, specifically including the anterior amygdala, the uncus, the piriform cortex, perirhinal cortex, as well as parahippocampal gyrus, are important in terms of optimizing chances of seizure freedom. So overall, our goal of laser ablation for mesial temporal lobe epilepsy involves ablation of the amygdala, particularly the mesial portions of the amygdala, hippocampal head, parahippocampal gyrus, entorhinal cortex, perirhinal cortex, and piriform cortex. In terms of the posterior extent, the ablation should carry to the level of the lateral mesencephalic sulcus, and ablations beyond this point should be performed with caution, particularly because there may be greater risk of inducing visual field deficits by also involving portions of Mayer's loop. As much as I've emphasized biasing the ablation more medially, it's critical to keep in mind what lies on the other side of the peel border within the cisterns. Specifically, we should be worried about the third and fourth cranial nerves, as heat spread to these structures can result in diplopia, whether it be temporary or permanent. Typically, the cerebral spinal fluid within the adjacent cistern acts as an excellent heat sink, but if the cranial nerve runs too close to the mesial structures, then there may be little to no potential for cerebral spinal fluid to serve this purpose. As you can see from the results in this series, when the cranial nerve passed within one millimeter of the mesial structures, there was a significantly higher chance of cranial nerve palsies, particularly when temperatures increased by more than seven to eight degrees Celsius. So based on this, it's very important to understand the relationship of the cranial nerve to the mesial structures. If the cranial nerve is more than one millimeter away, then temperatures can be allowed to increase without significant concern. But if the cranial nerve lies within one millimeter of the mesial structures, then there may not be sufficient CSF to serve as a heat sink, and the surgeon should try to maintain temperatures below 45 degrees centigrade, which is an approximately seven degree increase in overall temperature.
So preoperatively, it's important to identify the course, particularly of the third nerve. And this can be identified on coronal T2 imaging with thin slice acquisitions. Starting posteriorly, it's easiest to identify the third nerve, which is here, between the superior cerebellar artery and the posterior cerebral artery. As we move forward, we can continue to follow its course and see how close it lies to the mesial structures. In this particular example, we can see how there is sufficient space of CSF between the third nerve and the adjacent uncus. We can continue to follow this forward and assess the CSF space between the third nerve and the uncus until it enters the superior orbital fissure anteriorly. Now, let's take a look at the steps towards planning a typical trajectory through the long axis of the amygdala hippocampal complex used for treatment of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. Given the length of the overall trajectory to cannulate the long axis of the amygdala hippocampal complex, my general approach is to set a series of intermediate targets and intermediate entry points along the intended trajectory. So my first target is at the level of the hippocampal head. Here, I will pick a point within the hippocampus itself. This point is located between one third and one half of the way from the medial edge of the hippocampus. Next, I move back to the level of the hippocampal body where the hippocampus is most concave relative to the brainstem and ambient cistern. I define an intermediate entry point located within the hippocampal body itself. Again, this is located relatively medial within the hippocampus in order to ensure that the most medial portions of the hippocampus will be covered within the ablation. As such, this point is typically one quarter or one third of the way from the medial border of the hippocampus. The next task is to extend this entry point towards the cortical surface. We also aim to maintain a completely extraventricular trajectory. In order to do this, we must cannulate this corridor that is defined by the lateral ventricle superiorly and the collateral sulcus or occipital temporal sulcus inferiorly. This corridor typically serves as the most limiting portion of the trajectory. As such, as we extend the trajectory posteriorly, I typically stop at the level of the tectum in order to identify this corridor and adjust the trajectory so it passes squarely through it. Finally, the trajectory is extended back towards the cortical surface, ideally towards the crest of a gyrus. In addition, the trajectory is also advanced anteriorly towards the anterior portion of the amygdala in order to ensure complete ablation of this structure as well. As these adjustments are being made, the surgeon must keep in mind the three critical points along the trajectory, specifically the level of the hippocampal head, the hippocampal body, as well as the posterior corridor at the level of the tectum. The posterior corridor is typically the most restrictive, so I typically consider this a pivot point that anchors the trajectory while minor adjustments are being made to both the entry point and the target. So ultimately, what we get is a trajectory that looks something like this. It enters first at the crest of a gyrus, and as we progress anteriorly, we see that it passes squarely through the posterior corridor defined by the ventricle, collateral sulcus, and the occipital temporal sulcus. It enters the hippocampal body and hugs the medial border as it progresses anteriorly to the hippocampal head again at the medial border and squarely through the amygdala. Before I deem my trajectory planning complete, I perform an estimate of the structures that can be ablated with this trajectory. Roughly, the system is able to make ablations of approximately 16 millimeters in diameter. This is obviously influenced by the presence of CSF spaces, which act as heat sinks. But by changing the trajectory diameter to 16 millimeters, I can get a rough estimate of the structures that I will be able to ablate. As you can see here, this ablation covers most of the amygdala missing only a very small portion of the mesial aspect and it covers the entirety of the hippocampus. What you also see is that a 16 millimeter ablation is not necessarily as you extend posteriorly through the hippocampal body. 
In fact, if we maintain this diameter of ablation posteriorly, we risk surrounding structures, most significantly Mayer's loop fibers, which run lateral to the ventricle and are typically more prominent posteriorly. Next, I wanted to talk about specific targeting for the piriform cortex. This structure has been shown to be of particular importance in the treatment of mesial temporal lobe epilepsy. As such, it is certainly worthwhile to include this structure in the intended ablation. A helpful way to visualize this structure is on a reconstruction that is partway between an axial and coronal image. This has been referred to as the piriform axis and lies approximately 20 degrees off of the ACPC plane. The benefit of this reconstruction is that it allows visualization of the hippocampus, the amygdala, as well as the piriform cortex in a single plane. So in the setting of laser ablation, our goal is to target the temporal limb of the piriform cortex and not necessarily its entirety. So when planning for a piriform cortex ablation, we not only have to take into consideration the location of the laser probe, but we should also consider the ablation that will be made possible by this probe location. And while I am focusing on targeting the piriform cortex, truly a second laser probe trajectory also allows us to more completely address the mesial structures, ones that may have been missed on a long axis hippocampal trajectory. So ultimately, because of their anatomical relationship, we should be able to target not only the piriform cortex here, but also the uncus and residual mesial structures that may be missed with a long axis laser trajectory. With that in mind, we don't necessarily want to target the piriform cortex directly. If we were to do so and place the laser probe in this vicinity here, then we would be limited in terms of restricting heat spread towards the frontal limb of the piriform cortex and the basal ganglia. As a result, we may be left with a relatively small ablation that although it may be able to cover the temporal limb of the piriform cortex, it would fail to cover other adjacent structures. I therefore place my target point more inferiorly within the body of the amygdala. As you can see here, this target is in the superior portion of the amygdala and is in line with the most medially projecting portion of the uncus. If we look at this initial target on a conventional coronal plane, we see that this initial target is approximately five to six millimeters below the piriform cortex, which again corresponds to the most measly projecting portion of the uncus. In truth, this point may be very close within a few millimeters of the long axis trajectory as it extends through the anterior portion of the amygdala. In order to plan the rest of the trajectory, an entry point at the crest of a gyrus is determined. Given the orientation of gyral and sulcal anatomy in this portion of the brain, this entry point is typically found in the temporal lobe in the region just above the external auditory meatus. Once this entry point has been defined, the target is then extended to the most medial aspect of the uncus. Again, this allows not only for ablation of the piriform cortex, but also critical mesial structures that may be missed by a long axis trajectory alone. The resulting trajectory typically enters the middle temporal gyrus, again in the region above the external auditory meatus. The trajectory then traverses the temporal stem goes above the temporal horn and enters the amygdala and ultimately terminates at the most mesial portion of the uncus. Again, I find it helpful to estimate the structures that will be ablated with this trajectory. In doing so, we can also predetermine the ablation diameter. Although the system is capable of ablations that are larger, for this trajectory, ablations in the 10 to 12 millimeter diameter range are typically adequate. As you can see here, it covers the mesial structures and the piriform cortex. Certainly, we do not want to extend the ablation too far. Doing so would result in significant ablation of the temporal stem. So in this process, it is also important to predetermine the ablation length, which for this trajectory is typically on the order of 15 millimeters. This approach with two lasers allows adequate coverage of the target structures including the amygdala, piriform cortex, hippocampus, 
parahippocampal gyrus, entorhinocortex, and perirhinocortex. It is really critical to maintain a trajectory that covers the medial aspects of these structures. Doing so allows the surgeon to leverage the heat sinks created by the cisterns and create curved ablations even with a straight laser probe. I hope you found this approach to laser ablation of the mesial temporal lobe structures helpful. I thank you for your time and attention.